Hi, my name is Katherine Hayhill, and I am honored to be giving a series distinguished lecture. When I got the invitation, I was very excited. I thought, well, maybe this would be a great opportunity to talk about some of the cool new science we've been doing. Looking at self-reinforcing feedbacks between the ocean and the atmosphere in the Gulf of Mexico that are increasing the risk of drought over Texas, especially in a warming world. No, said John, who invited me, we want you to talk about talking about climate change. Now, I've talked about that a few times, but what I want to do today is talk about how I came to start talking about climate change. Because I'm an atmospheric scientist, and like many of us, my interest began at an early age with science. When I went to graduate school, my sole ambition, maybe one day, was to perhaps become an IPCC author. I certainly had absolutely no idea that I might be hosting a PBS digital show, that I'd be getting an email saying, why didn't you respond to our invitation to attend the Time 100 Gala? Well, I didn't respond because I thought the first email was spam, so I deleted it. I never thought I'd be speaking in thousand-year-old churches, and I certainly never thought I'd be sharing the stage with these two guys who you may recognize. It all began at an early age. My dad was a science teacher. My grandma had a degree in science education. My great-grandpa was an entomologist, so I couldn't really escape. Here, on the left, you can see the results of our science experiment that summer. Catch, temporarily store, and release the fish so we could look at the proportion of rock bass to smallmouth bass to perch and sunfish in our lake. Over here is the telescope that went on every family vacation. Whether down to the Outer Banks to see Halley's Comet, that telescope accompanied us everywhere we go, and that's probably why we had a station wagon. Growing up in Canada, I had the idea that the grass was green, the sky was blue, and climate was changing due to human activities. It wasn't until I moved to the U.S. to go to graduate school that I discovered, much to my shock, there were people who did not drink, and there were people who didn't think that climate change was real. But in graduate school, I saw those people as distant and far off, sort of like, you know, I'm over here and they live over there in a very different place. And then I moved to Texas. Within a couple of months of moving to Texas, a colleague asked me to guest teach his undergraduate geology class. The classroom looked something like this, except a little bit more dark and cavernous. It was early in the morning, so many of the students were kind of slumped over dozing or looking at their phones. Because it was a geology class, I began with the fundamental components of the climate system. I waded through the geologic climate record and ice core data. I explained natural cycles and the role of carbon dioxide, both natural and human produced in controlling Earth's climate. I ended my lecture, as many of us do, with an invitation for any questions and one hand immediately shot up. Someone had been listening and cared enough to ask a question, I thought. He stood up, I looked encouraging, he cleared his throat, and then in a loud and belligerent tone, he stated, you're a Democrat, aren't you? That was my introduction into what is now a way of life in the United States. Climate change is a casualty of a much greater phenomena. And it's this phenomena here, the one of political polarization. These are some charts from the Pew Political Polarization Survey they've been conducting since 1994. And when they first started, this is what the political landscape of the US looked like. It was nice and normally distributed. The medians were close together, but over time, we start to see that change. 2011, 2015, 2017, and then if you only look at people who are politically active, it looks even worse. The distributions are completely skewed to each side and the medians are miles apart. What does this have to do with our opinions about climate change? Everything. Why? Because the number one predictor of whether we think climate is changing due to human activities these days is simply where we fall on that polarization spectrum. When they surveyed voters before the last presidential election and they asked them, is climate change mostly human or mostly natural or not happening? You can see the results. There is what I would assume to be a very statistically significant difference between these two populations. Why is that? Well, when we hear people say things like, for everyone who thinks it's warming, I can find someone who isn't, or even worse, 
alarmist theories on climate science originate with scientists who operate outside the principles of the scientific method, we often think if they just knew the facts, they'd change their minds, right? But this is based on the assumption that people are blank slates. In education, it's something known as the knowledge deficit model, the idea that if we just provide people with correct information, they will change their minds. What I appreciate about the social sciences is that they can test for this type of thing. And so one early study by Dan Cahan in 2012 found no support for the idea that if people don't have the right opinion about climate change, all we have to do is give them more information. In fact, what this study found is that people with the highest degree of scientific literacy were not most concerned about climate change, rather they were the ones among whom cultural polarization was greatest. Another study by Larry Hamilton from the University of New Hampshire looked at whether people agreed that climate change is happening now caused mainly by human activities. And he divided out people's answers by their level of education, as well as their self-identified political party. Here you have people who self-identify as Democrat, as Republican, and as Tea Party. With some high school education, they're pretty close together. Then some university education, they start to differ. Then we get to university graduates and they're further apart. And then we end up with postgraduates and they're even further apart. More education actually pushed people further away from each other rather than bringing us together. A more recent study by Dan Cahan and colleagues found that more numerate subjects use their quantitative reasoning capacity selectively to conform their interpretation of the data to the result most consistent with their political ideology. Let me translate that. It doesn't make us more accepting of science to be better able to handle quantitative information. It just makes us better able to cherry pick what we need to validate what we already believe. People are not blank slates. Our slates have been written on by very clever and deliberate hands. For more on that, you could see the book or the movie Merchants of Doubt that Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway wrote. But then you might say, okay, well, it's, if it's not more information, then I know what the problem is, it's religion. As some politicians say, climate change is not a science, it's a religion. Or the arrogance of people to think that we human beings would be able to change what God is doing in the climate is outrageous. So let's get the Pope to set them straight. Because we all know that the Pope has a lot of good things to say about climate change. In fact, he wrote a whole book called an encyclical that among many things points out that global warming is human caused and it's due to the consumption of some wealthy nations and it has repercussions on the poorest places on the planet. The Pope gets it. It's real, it's us, and it's serious. Now, when we look at polling data, and in this case, they're polling people to say, how concerned are you about climate change? Dark orange is very concerned, light orange is somewhat concerned, and then blue is not concerned. When we look at the polling data, we say, okay, well, this looks pretty good because Hispanic Catholics are the most concerned people about a changing climate. Let's fill in the rest of the data here. Here's the rest of the data, and who do we have at the very bottom? At the bottom, we have white Catholics. You might say, hang on a second. Uh, is this not the same Pope? Yes. Oh, but look at the date. This was published just before the encyclical came out. So surely white Catholics moved up. No. Other research by my colleague here at Texas Tech, Ashley Landrum, has found that actually the encyclical served to divide Catholics even further. In other words, if they didn't agree with what the Pope was saying, their response was pretty much, oh, bless his heart which in Texas is not really a nice thing to say to somebody. John Evans, another social scientist, looked into this and he said, compared to the not actively religious, it's true that conservative Protestants, and I would add that I think this probably applies to Catholics also, are less likely to believe the conclusiveness of climate science. But he went on to say, controlling for demographic properties show that it's not, and what John actually said was, engaging in fundamentalist discourse, but I said, hey, it's just going to church. It's not going to church that causes this effect. What is it? Opinions are rooted in age, political conservatism, and the Republican Party. Galen Carey is the government relations director for the National Association of Evangelicals, and he hits the nail on the head. Many evangelicals, he says, and again, you could probably add white Catholics there too, 
oppose actions to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, but politically because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. Remember Senator Inhofe, the one who said the arrogance of humans to think that we could interfere with what God is doing. That same year he said this. In an interview with Rachel Maddow, he said, do you realize that I was actually on your side of this issue when I was first chairing the Senate Environment Committee and I heard about it? I was on your side until when? Until I found out how much it would cost. So that's why when we have conversations about climate change, it often looks like this. Susie the scientist shows up with all of her dozens of IPCC reports and thousands of pages, and what does Calvin respond with? Calvin responds with his identity, which he feels is being attacked, not directly by the science, but by the actions, the solutions that are being implied by that science, which have everything to do with big government, taxation, loss of personal liberties, and all kind of profoundly un-American values. And that's why the conversation often ends something like this. Is there any way to have a civil and positive conversation? The answer to that, I found, is yes, with an asterisk. So going back to that cavernous lecture hall where I was first asked after a hour-long lecture on geologic carbon if I was a Democrat, what did I say? I was completely taken aback. This is the first time anybody had ever asked me that. All I could think of to say was, no, I'm a Canadian. Because we don't really identify ourselves by political parties, not that many of us. And I can't vote in the United States anyways. And honestly, at that time, I was completely mystified as to how on earth he made that connection and why he was even asking me that. But afterwards, I got out of the class, I thought about it, I realized what was going on. And then... I got an invitation to speak to the local League of Women Voters. So I got all my science together and I went there and I talked science, science, science. And all the questions I got from those women who were genuinely curious, they had invited me because they wanted to know, you know, is climate changing? Are humans responsible? All the questions I got were not questions about more science, but they were questions about, well, why should I care? What does that mean for us? What are we supposed to do about it? Did you just come here to tell us about a problem and not even answer any, any of the questions that we have? So I took all that to heart. I rearranged my presentation. I added more information on why this matters and um, started thinking about, well, I don't know, what are we supposed to do about it? And then I got invited to speak to the American Association of University Women's branch in Lubbock. So I went along, I took my slides, I talked science, 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 and I started to talk a little bit about why we should care. And then somebody from there invited me to the senior citizen's home. So each time as I went along, I listened very carefully to what people had to say. And again, they weren't asking for more scientific facts. Now granted, they had just gotten a 45 minute earful of them. But what they were asking was, they were saying, well, what does this matter to me? I'm somebody who lives here in West Texas, or I farm, or I'm concerned about water or the economy. How is it going to affect me? And what am I supposed to do about it? Because all I hear about is recycling and light bulbs. And we don't even have a recycling program in town anyway, so what am I supposed to do? Well, then I got invited to Second Baptist Church. Not First Baptist, Second Baptist. Second Baptist kind of tries out the iffy stuff first. I've actually never been invited to First Baptist Church. So by then, I'd realized that people were thinking that I was, you know, other. You know, she's the scientist and she cares about it because it's science, but I want to understand why I should care about it because of who I am. But here's the thing. I'm a Christian and I share a lot of beliefs and values with the people who I presume went to Second Baptist Church. So that was when I decided to do something that is profoundly uncomfortable for us as scientists. And that is to share with them not just the scientific facts, not just the data, not just all the information that we have collected on how we know climate is changing and humans are responsible. I decided to share for the very first time, not just from my head, but from my heart as well. 
I decided to tell them that the reason why I cared about this issue and the reason why I was there talking to them about this was because I was a Christian too. And it was like the windows opened. It was incredible for me personally to feel like I was able to connect with people on a very different level. And then for people there who were absolutely shocked because they had just assumed that they'd invited the stereotypical liberal tree hugging atheist scientist. And here was somebody actually saying that they cared about this issue because of the very same values that they had. Then I was asked to speak at the Rotary Club. Now I am not a Rotarian, but as I walked in, to the Rotary Club, I noticed this giant banner that had the four-way test on it. And I looked at it and I thought, this is climate change. Is it the truth? Yes. Is it fair? Absolutely not. Would it build goodwill and better friendships to do something about it? Yes. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Well, if we don't, then it won't be. And if we do fix it, then it will be. So I took my presentation and I skipped the chicken dinner lunch and I rearranged my whole presentation into the four-way test. I went through the Rotarian four-way test on climate change, and afterwards I will never forget one businessman coming up to me with this completely bemused look on his face. He said, you know, I wasn't too sure about this whole global warming thing, but it passed the four-way test. As in, what can I do? It must be true. How did that happen? It happened because I was able to put this issue into the frame of values that he had, and it connected directly with what he held to be important in his life. That was when the light bulb went on for me too. So now when I talk to people, the first and most important thing, whether it's an individual conversation or a presentation to an audience, is to figure out what do we have in common that we both already respect or appreciate or value? Now, sometimes it's really hard to, to find that, and sometimes somebody else might be better suited to have that conversation than me. But often we can find those things that we share with people. Like what? Well, they can be very basic. Are you a birder? Do you enjoy skiing? Do you like fishing? Do you live in Boulder, Colorado, which suffered incredible floods? Are you a parent who cares about the future of your child? There are so many ways that we can bond with people over things that we enjoy doing, the community that we live in, um, things that we're concerned about, that we're passionate about, that we love. And then the second step is to connect. Given who we both are, then why does climate change matter to us both? You see the difference? Well, I'm not saying I care about climate change because da 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 da, and I want to tell you, I want to explain to you why you should care about it because you don't have the right values and I will help you understand. You know how condescending that sounds? The reality is, is that just about everybody has the values they need to care about a changing climate. We just haven't connected the dots. And so the first step is to figure out what things that there are that people already care about. And then the second step is to connect those to the issue of climate change. Because if we're a human living on this planet, if we like having clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and enough food to eat and a safe place to live and a healthy economy and a great place to bring up our kids, well, there you go. We have things in common right away. And after that, we can just build. So what type of things do I connect on in Texas? Well, for example, in Texas, we get more billion dollar weather and climate disasters than any other state in the United States. Since 1980, there's been 102 events that have caused more than a billion dollars worth of damage. Everybody in Texas has a weather story. In fact, often I start a conversation or a class or a presentation with having people talk about what they've lived through. The tornado, the windstorm, the hail, the supercell thunderstorm, the blizzard. Yeah, we get blizzards in Texas too. The hurricane, the drought. We all have our crazy weather stories. And we all know how those events impacted us and our families and our communities. And then I connect it to a changing climate. Did you know that climate is changing? And decade by decade, it's sneaking in and replacing another number on those dice with another six. So we always have a chance of naturally rolling that double six, but all of a sudden the chance of rolling that double six is starting to go up and up and up, and we're seeing more and more of those double sixes show up, and even the occasional seven. 
in Texas, we get droughts and floods. We get dust storms and haboobs. We get hurricanes and we get wildfires. Everybody knows what those look like. And everybody has a sense now that, hey, we've always had these before, but we feel like they're starting to get stronger or more frequent. They're different than they used to be. And that is a point of connection. What if I'm talking to faith-based audiences? Well, there, one of the points of connection is to talk about how climate change is disproportionately affecting the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. I love this picture of a Texas road sign. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant it, signed God. What if I'm not? That's okay. There's all kinds of different ways we can connect. We can talk about the terrible ski season last year. We can talk about how the Baltimore Orioles is no longer going to be native to Baltimore as climate changes. We can talk about livable cities and what we'd like to do to our community to make it better for everyone to live there. And we can talk about water, how important it is for all of us. Then the third step, and honestly, this is even optional sometimes, but the third step, not the first, not the second, third is to explain. Now, at this point, you may be saying, ah, oh, finally something I can do. This is what we scientists do. We explain. We explain with blue slides and yellow font that are largely comprehensible and covered in lots of unlabeled figures and tiny font, not to mention equations. No, that is not what I'm talking about. We also like to explain by talking about what we don't know. Because when we write a journal article, when we uh, propose a, a, a research proposal, when we present our results of our research at AGU or AMS or ESA, we talk, we focus primarily on what we don't know. But that is not the way that we talk to people about a changing climate because we have known since the 1850s that carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas and higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would lead to higher temperatures. We've known since the 1890s exactly how much higher those temperatures would be. We've known since the 1930s that yes, thermometers all over the world are recording a rise in temperature. And it's been over 50 years since US scientists felt confident enough in what we know to formally warn a US president of the dangers of climate change. That US president was Lyndon B. Johnson. So when we explain about a changing climate to people, the most important thing to do is to talk about what we do know. What do we know? We know that it's real and we know that it's us. And this is a great graphic that used some simulations that Gavin Schmidt did using the GIST model. It was done by Bloomberg and it's an animation that actually goes through the temperature change as a result of all these different factors and shows that yes, the only factor that can account for the observed warming are human factors. We can also explain to people that it's serious and that scientists agree. Because when you ask the general population, do you think scientists agree that climate is changing uh, due to human activities, most people think we're 50-50. Why? Because when you turn on the TV, all you see is Bill Nye talking to another talking head. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Sometimes it's Bill Nye with three heads. Sometimes it's Bill Nye with five heads. The reality is, it is a vast majority of us who agree not only that climate is changing, not only that humans are affecting it, but that humans are the dominant cause of the observed warming. And that is a really important and clear message to communicate. In fact, social science research has shown that that message, scientists agree, is the single short piece of information that changes the most minds. Lastly, and this is the hardest for us to do, we need to talk solutions because imagine this. Imagine you've been running out low grade fever for days, weeks, now months, and it goes up and down from day to day, but it's starting to get higher and higher and you're getting worried about it. You go to the doctor and the doctor runs all kinds of tests and then the doctor calls you into their office and they say, well, I figured out what it is and I reviewed it with a hundred different colleagues and over 97 of them totally agree that this is what it is and the doctor explains to you what it is. And then you say, okay, well, so, so what am I supposed to do about it? And the doctor says, oh, well, that's not my job. I can't really tell you that. And you're like, well, you know, who should I? Oh, I don't know. Well, what should I? No. When we're telling somebody about a problem, we don't have to be engineers. We don't have to be policy experts. We're not. But we do need to give people some sense of what can be done to fix it. And not just a sense of what can be done, but how we can work together in positive ways that are compatible with our values. 
I've had to do a ton of reading on this. And again, I'm not a solutions expert, and I'm not trying to prescribe a specific solution to any person or group of people. What I am trying to do is I hope what a good physician would do, which is provide people with a smorgasbord, a variety, a range of solutions that they can explore further to figure out how they can best engage. So what if I'm talking to people who live here in Lubbock, Texas, where I live? Well, one of the most important things for people here in any college town is the university. So I can tell people that our recycling program, which was started by the housing department on campus, is student run. And by donating, essentially, your garbage to Texas Tech, which can, can include old fabric, styrofoam, as well as the traditional glass and plastic and cardboard, you put it all in one big bag, you bring it to the recycling center that is open 24-7, the proceeds support 35 student scholarships. So by giving our garbage to the university, we are actually supporting student scholarships at the university. And honestly, that's pretty cool. What else can I talk about? I can talk about all the amazing opportunities that clean energy brings to Texas. The fact that Fort Hood, the biggest army base in the country, which is of course in Texas, <laughs> last year when they were looking at uh, their energy options, they realized that going with a new contract for wind and solar energy would save them about $165 million compared to getting the same amount of energy from natural gas. And that is money that saves the taxpayers. That's pretty cool. Here in Texas, we're always breaking new wind energy records, and we have 25,000 jobs in the wind energy sector. We can also talk about little towns like Georgetown which has gone 100% green, not because they're a bunch of tree huggers, but because business students from the local college crunched the numbers and went to the city and explained to them how much money they could save. Green energy is good for Texas, and we can talk about that. What if I'm talking to farmers? Well, actually farmers have a lot of the land that a lot of these wind turbines are going on. So we can have great conversations about how you can actually put turbines on your land and you just farm around it and the check arrives in the mail. But in addition with farmers, we can also talk about things like stewardship and conservation. Reducing the water that we use as well as the water that we need through going from these old 1950s style pivot irrigation to drip irrigation in ground that uses a lot less water with hardly any evaporative losses. Looking at dry land agriculture, mixed crops, new hybrids that are more drought tolerant. Working with other people to reduce their water because water really is point of contention across much of Texas, especially between municipalities, ag users, and even energy users. We can talk about other adaptations like different agricultural techniques, the simple fact that some people are considering moving their operations further north. These are all things that they know more about than I do, and so rather than trying to be prescriptive, because I mean, what do I honestly know about this? Rather than being prescriptive, I'm just bringing up ideas that other people have proposed and opening them up for discussion with people who, like I said, know a lot more about this than I do. What if I'm talking to a Christian missions conference? Now, people who are interested in missions are often very aware of and concerned about issues of justice, equity, and even sustainability and stewardship but they're not often on board with the idea that climate is changing due to human activities. So when we talk about a changing climate with people who are actively working with the poorest and most disadvantaged people here in the US as well as around the world, I often start by talking about loving our global neighbor. And I show how the very places where the greatest percentage of the population lives in poverty are the exact same places where we disproportionately expect to see the impacts of a changing climate. And then I explain to them how I care about climate change because I feel like it's a hole in our bucket. We are pouring everything we have into this bucket to try to help people who are hungry, who are poor, who don't have access to clean drinking water, who live in unsafe conditions. We're pouring everything we have into this bucket, but there's a hole in the bucket and the hole is climate change and it's getting bigger and bigger. I care about a changing climate because I care about poverty and hunger and injustice. That's why I care. And that's why they should care too. Now, what if I'm talking to the oil and gas industry? This was the toughest for me. Because when I got my first invitation to speak at a sustainable fracking conference, I thought to myself, 
okay, if I'm going to bond with them, if I'm going to actually start with shared values, what are those values? I mean, I go around telling people how we have to wean ourselves off coal and gas and oil because that is the primary reason why climate is changing. How am I going to bond and connect with people who this is their entire livelihood? I thought about that for a while and then I realized something. I realized that I am profoundly grateful for fossil fuels. Yes, you heard that right. I am grateful for refrigerators. Imagine what our life would be like if we had to go shopping every single day. I am profoundly grateful for electricity and light bulbs. I am grateful for cars and other forms of transportation. And I'm particularly grateful for the medical advances that came with the Industrial Revolution, which was powered by fossil fuels, because without those advances, I would have died at a very early age. I am grateful for where fossil fuels has brought us to. I'm grateful for the quality of life that we, all of us, and in particular women, are able to have as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And I appreciate that these people in the fossil fuel industry are the ones who enabled that to happen. That is a value that I genuinely have and that I was genuinely able to connect with them over. And then what's more, it's not just about me or us. It's a fact that nearly a billion people in the world do not have access to energy or electricity. And as a result, their lives are much more difficult and often even shorter than ours. And that's not fair. I'm profoundly grateful that my kitchen doesn't look like this. I spent part of my childhood in South America. I had friends who lived in places like this and I stayed at their houses and I know what it's like. Indoor air pollution from cooking kills millions of people a year. If those people had access to the energy they needed to have stoves and fridges, that would actually save lives. So when I'm talking to people in the energy industry, often they're very knowledgeable about the science. And so sometimes we get way into the explaining. Like remember how I said the explaining part can be super short and sometimes you can even skip it. Well, when I'm talking to people who are very knowledgeable, sometimes the explaining part it starts off with 10 minutes and it ends up being an hour. You can talk about the atmospheric window. You can talk about the history of how long we've known that extraction of fossil fuels produces heat trapping gases. We can talk about the ice cores and how temperature and CO2 go up and down together and where we currently are in orbital cycles. And then when it comes to solutions, I have to acknowledge that I don't have the answer for them. I don't have a crystal ball that I can look into and tell them what the solutions are for their industry. But what I can do is I can start the conversation. And I can start the conversation by pointing out that in the future, our energy is going to look very different. And it just makes sense to look down that road and see what's coming and start to prepare. This applies to energy policy, talking about putting a price on carbon. It applies to transportation. Our cars are changing very quickly. Can't wait for the flying Ubers. The future of electricity. Today, around the world, more new solar is being installed than any other type of new power generation. Whether it's China, Texas, or India, the world is changing very quickly. So my question to them is, how can we prepare for these changes that are already happening today? Because you know energy. You know energy better than anyone. You've been doing energy for years and decades. We still need energy in the future, unless we want to return to the Stone Age and go living in caves, which I don't. So how can we make sure that we are still getting the energy we need in the future in a way that is safe, in a way that is secure, and in a way that continues to grow the economy? Even here in Texas, the future is changing. Whether it's wind turbines replacing old rusting oil rigs, or whether it's Fort Hood, like I talked about before, where the military is going with renewable energy because it simply saves money. So the template that I built through talking to the University Women's Club, Second Baptist Church, the Rotarians, the template that came together was this. First of all, what values do I really and truly share with whoever it is I'm talking to or with? Then how can I connect those to the issue of a changing climate? If we need to do any explaining about why this matters or how we know this is real, we can do it then. But lastly, we cannot forget 
to talk solutions because that is what gives us hope. Here's the challenge though. For most of us, outreach is not our primary role. Many of us want to do it because we think it's important. Some of us should never do it. So please do not feel the pressure from me. But whether we want to or not, the reality is, is that we don't necessarily have the time to do everything that people start asking us to do. Now, first of all, I want to share something with you that I've been thinking about for a while, but I've never really put it together or conceptualized it until now. And that is that there is a spectrum of outreach. And nothing annoys me more than when people are prescriptive and they say, you need to be here or you should be here or you absolutely should never be here on the spectrum. I feel very strongly that where we fall on the spectrum of outreach is a personal choice. It completely depends on how comfortable we are, how available we are, and what we feel is the right thing for us to do. So what does this outreach spectrum look like? Well, at the far end, we have all of us who do our research and publish it in discipline-specific journals like JGR or Journal of Climate. And then a little further down the outreach spectrum, we might have a Nature or PNAS paper that's read by more people than just our specific circle. If we're enterprising, we might write an essay for the conversation. If you've never read the conversation, it's a great source of discussion by academics of popular topics. What if we write a blog for an organization like the Union of Concerned Scientists? Well, that might be a little bit further down the spectrum. How about providing expert witness or testimony in a legal case? What about plugging into social media or speaking at your kid's school? How about signing up for a speakers bureau like Climate Voices where people can actually find you if they're looking for somebody who's willing to give a talk to their group? You could write a book. You could write many books. People practice civil disobedience. Some climate scientists are even chained to fences. And then if you're wondering, well, if that's not the end of the outreach spectrum, what is? I would say that the very end of the outreach spectrum is running for office because then you've pretty much sold out. You're doing 100% outreach and you have 0% time to do research. The whole point here though is not to move from right to left. The goal here is to determine where each of us can uniquely contribute most effectively. So once we figure that out though, how can we do it? Because for most of us, again, outreach is not our primary role. The time and the mental energy required can quickly become overwhelming, trust me on that one. So how can we shepherd our time wisely to make sure that we are most effective? I'm still working on this. but. Again, over the years, when I've, when I've, through trial and error, figured out how to talk about climate change, also through trial and error, I've been figuring out how do you do it? How do you actually do this stuff? So my strategy is this. First of all, identify who I can engage with most effectively because I share the most values with them. Second of all, play to my strengths. Third, set my limits and stick to them, and that is the hardest thing to do. And then four, keep my go-to resources handy. Let me explain what I mean by each of these. Well, identifying our audience, we've already started to talk about that. Am I a birder or a skier? Do I fish? Do I live in a certain community? Am I a parent? What is it that I share with whoever it is that I'm talking with? Now, let me just pause for a moment and talk about who is not our audience. This is the Six Americas of Global Warming. If you're not familiar with it, it's a great resource. You can find it easily online. And it divides people up not into yes or no, but into a spectrum of people based on how they feel about a changing climate. Are they alarmed or concerned? Are they cautious or disengaged? Are they doubtful or are they dismissive? My definition of a dismissive person is somebody who, if an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real and foot high letters of flame appear before them, they would dismiss them. So if they would dismiss that, why would we expect them to accept thousands of pages of IPCC reports, tens of thousands of peer reviewed journal articles, or anything I say? They won't. Why? Because for a dismissive person, rejecting the science of climate change is so much part of who they are 
But asking them to change their mind about it is like asking them to cut off a body part or remove part of their brain. It's their identity to reject the science of climate change. But they are also often the loudest voices on social media, in the comment section, writing op-eds to the local newspaper, the angry email you get after you present it at your kid's school. That's typically a dismissive. Now, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen things like this. And you might say, well, yeah, but Catherine, I've seen you respond to some of these people. I don't respond to most of these people I'm showing you here because if they're just going to insult me right off the bat, then obviously there's no good conversation to be had. But if they don't immediately insult me, if they wait a few tweets before doing so, I will respond typically once or twice. Do I really think that I have any chance of convincing these people? No. I mean, out of a couple of hundred people that I've talked to like this on social media over the last few months, there's only one person who said, that's very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing this information with me. I'll look into it. One person. So why am I talking to these people? Because there's thousands of other people who are actually looking at this. And those people come from the different groups. They come from alarmed, concerned, cautious, even disengaged and doubtful. These are the people that we are talking to people who we have a snowball's chance of actually convincing, not just that the science is real, but more importantly, that there are things we can do to fix it. The second part of my strategy is to play to our strengths. What do I mean by that? Well, what do you enjoy doing? Do you enjoy writing like Jacqueline Gill does with her blog? Do you enjoy talking to people like Steve Running does, giving frequent presentations in Montana? Do you enjoy gaming? Dargan Ferson and Josh Lawler at the University of Washington are working with other researchers and scientists to design simulations and interactive games. Do you enjoy video? This is an old video from a number of years ago talking about how climate change is terrifying and look at how many views it got. Six million. Now, unfortunately, that's not really the case for climate science. I did a webinar this past summer on the first volume of the National Climate Assessment, kind of an update on the climate science. And on Twitter, I complained that the webinar that I uploaded a week ago has about a thousand views, which is very respectable for a climate science video. But the Fortnite video that my child uploaded the day before has 10,000 views. Guess what happened? Climate Fortnite. Yes. Henry Drake, who's a graduate student at MIT, saw this. He's a Fortnite player. He said, hey, let's do this. So they put together over 30 graduate students, professors, scientists, who either play Fortnite or are willing to give it a try. My colleague Andy Dessler at Texas A&M is apparently the best scientist player they have. And they've been playing regularly on Tuesday nights. The other day, Henry said, Wow, we just played two games with a climate skeptic out of the blue, and it was really interesting. We had to push back on a few of the standard skeptic talking points, but he was pretty fair and conceded a lot. How cool is that? Social engagement might be our strength, and there's all kinds of organizations we can engage with. Citizens Climate Lobby has many scientists and chapters all over the country. Union of Concerned Scientists represents scientists everywhere, too. Interfaith Power and Light, women's organizations, there's many ways to engage with organizations that amplify our voices. Number three is to set my limits and stick to them. And this is the hardest one. How much time can I afford to spend? What are my top priorities? Be prepared to enforce these limits and say no. Even when the cutest kitten in the world asks you, or even when the most evil kitten in the world says, Catherine Aho said it would never rain in Texas again, and now look, it's raining. She's such a liar. And you're like, oh, I can easily show you that I never said that. But do you think you'll make a difference? No. Lastly, I keep my go-to resources handy. Like what? Well, what I've found is rather than arguing with people, especially in social media, but in other places too, rather than arguing point by point, by point it's much more effective to say, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So many other people have had that question that there's a really good answer here. Let me point you to it. Where do I find these really good answers? Well, one of the best resources is skepticalscience.com. 
they have entries for just about every but what about question you may have heard. And what I love about them is they have the short answer, they have the medium answer, and then they have the full enchilada where they actually link directly to the original scientific studies as well. So it's a great resource and people can go as deep as they want to using this. We also have our global weirding series on YouTube. We've got 25 episodes so far. We're doing another 10 or 12 for season three in a few more weeks. And in our global weirding series, each short video, which is usually about six or seven minutes long, each short video starts with a common question that we've heard, like, isn't it just a natural cycle? Or isn't renewable energy a luxury for people who can afford to buy Priuses? Or how about all those hurricanes were they caused by global warming? Having these videos is really helpful because it gives people a resource that they can share, and especially for people who aren't interested in reading long articles or scientific journals, then it gives them a chance to just listen to some information. I use the National Climate Assessment a lot. I love it because it has information for each sector, for each different region. The third National Climate Assessment has a great frequently asked questions section. And then of course the fourth one that uh, the science part came out in 2017 and the impacts are coming out in 2018. That one also has a lot of good resources as well. So over the years, through trial and error, through failure and success, I've learned that we can talk about climate. We can talk about climate change with people who are doubtful, people who are disengaged, people who are cautious and concerned. We can't have a lot of productive conversations with people who are dismissive, but those people are only 10% of the population. With the rest of the population, we can have great conversations by first of all, bonding over genuinely shared values. Second, connecting those values to climate, why we both would care about this issue because of who we both are. Third, explaining what people need to know. And then fourth, and most importantly, finding ways that we can work together to act. When we look at the science, it doesn't give us a lot of hope. But when we look at the solutions at what people are doing in real life today, that is where we see the hope that we need to sustain us for long-term action. So the biggest thing that I've learned is this. What one of my favorite scientists said, Jane Goodall, just a few years ago at the end of a very long career in science. She said that it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. Thank you.